Ready? It's been a long week. Am I on the right panel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your corner. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the Wireless Village. On behalf of Rick Melendick, don't look behind you. I don't even know what to introduce you as. We'll just stick with Justin. Is Justin good? Justin. I think the exile's back there somewhere. Dragorn helped us a bunch. Heck, even Ronan's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> We're all really happy to have you here. We're all sitting down because this is going to be an informal panel because quite literally, I was the one in control of the call for papers. All of these three gentlemen of their own volition somehow submitted a talk. Shockingly, I accepted all of them. And, and this is my present to me. So you're all going to watch a man who's happier than he's ever been in his life as he questions three of his personal heroes. I think that a lot of you are here because that interests you. Uh, if not, you're, you're free to leave anytime you want. Uh, I've set aside a good deal of time for this because I think all three of these guys could take up two hours by themselves with no problem. In fact, Bonnet tried really hard to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Before I give a chance to introduce all of these people, let me just ask you guys the first question. Have you ever all been in the same room at the same table giving a presentation before? Oh wait, we need a goon to make sure a grenade's not going to be thrown in here. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get protection? Because if this table blows up, I mean, Russ and I are dead, no one will care, but the SDR world is screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so have you, you guys ever sat down together before like this in front of a live studio audience? No. No? Is this a first? Yeah, it is a first. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And you were there. And you're all here for the fun that I'm going to have. <laughs> all right. Introductions. This is Bonlent. He has written probably half the software that you've used if you've used SDR stuff. He's written none of the actively maintained software that you've used. <laughs> unless, you were write, unless you were using it while he was writing it, in which case... <laughs> he was still writing at that point. Uh, definitely a very good man to know as long as you follow his interests very closely so that it still works while you're working with it. Mike Osman, who has created the HackRF. Thank you, kind sir. And then are we going to go with Robert, Mike? What do we even call you? Sorry. This man has two real yeah. names. <laughs> Some of you know him as Mike Jones. Some of you know him. Some of you know him as Robert Kuldana, and he is one of the key members of the Blade RF team. He's quite cool. Lots of fun. He makes toys. So if you've ever run your own cell tower, thank this kind of gentleman right here. I'm going to start off with a couple of fun questions that I'm going to hope going to lead you guys into some really entertaining stories that I want the answers to. And I've got you lined up in the order that you spoke today, and I'm going to make you do that again roughly. Feel free to interject and tease each other as much as you want, as long as it's reasonably friendly. And if it's not reasonably friendly, like blood sport. <laughs> blood sport. So awesome, I'm not liking your chances. <laughs> All right. We have three of the top people in SDR, and my first question is, what on earth got you into this? What led you from where you were before you started this to, to this spot that you are today? So please, take it away. Shall we just talk? Or shall just we I'm originally from Sydney, and I was looking at the p car here. No, use, use the mic. Potter. And um, you know, you're scanning around. I inherited a bunch of receivers from my grandfather who had passed away, and he'd actually been um, the radio guy on the Lancaster Two bombers during World War Two. And uh, I was sort of scanning the airwaves with these Yaesu uh, receivers. And I heard some interesting tones coming out at, at certain frequencies in the 400 meg band it turned out to be the police. And the police had been analog and they'd recently moved to digital after some riots had occurred because they had been jammed. And um, I was interested in this kind of digital protocol that they were using. I did a bit more research and then I came across the P sorry, the, pro, uh, the P25, APCO P25 uh, implementation, open source implementation called OP25. I got on the mailing list there, and they had uh, a number of different front ends that you could use, either your own analog receiver, and you'd tap off the, um, the discriminator output, or you could use an SDR. Uh, and I tapped off the, the, the discriminator output, and I started decoding frames, and, I, and, I, whoop, and I, I submitted some patches, and this other guy got in touch 
um, with me via the, the mailing list there, my very good Australian friend Matt Robert, and he had actually purchased a USRP-1. And I didn't really know what these, this whole software-defined radio thing was about, and I would looked into GSM and the vulnerabilities in, in the encryption used, you know, A5 slash 1 and 2, uh, and I, I found the Hacker's Choice website, a German website, and they had a picture of the USAP one, and I thought, oh, this is, this is interesting. Got in touch with Matt, we met up, became fast friends, and um, I was actually doing my PhD at the time, which I dropped because I found SDR. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I quickly right. set about playing, playing about with the stuff, and, and I got so obsessed that it's all I was doing, and he had his SDR set up with an antenna, and, and one of the th early things I found about was Mode S. And uh, I don't know, who here knows about Frank Radio Rausch? Yeah? <laughs> it's the gods. <laughs> who is he? Where is he? I'm still trying to find him. Yeah, he's, he's this amazing character that had a, a really wicked sense of humor and set up this, this Google um, site on, Go on Google site, some personal thing. And he loves making jokes about cats. And, and he, I mean, he's, he's one of the, the most amazing sort of forerunners of, of, of doing DMOD on, on arbitrary signals. He looked at CDMA, he looked at Modus, all this kind of stuff. And he had, you know, he contributed to the, the first four level FSK and C4FM DMOD for OP25. Right. Um, well, which, I mean, he had done pre OP25. Yeah. OP25 people just found his implementation. Right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he did RD Lap as well when he was looking at the, the mobile data terminals. Uh, and, you know, amazingly talented guy, but a complete enigma, complete mystery. Anyway, long story short, met up with Matt. Too late. Um, <laughs> well, we have two hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> And then I started hacking on the Mode S receiver that I would run via the internet at his place. And then eventually, um, you know, that, that led on from there. Walk in front more. Cool. Check it out. All right. So, two minutes. Uh, that one doesn't go as far. That one's a little okay. longer there. Uh, That's right. So, Mike, how do you hide the horn? Is that what the hair is for? Oh, you're not going to give me the same question? No, no I'm going to give you the same oh. question. I just like to mess with you a little more than everybody else. So, <laughs> please, Mike, can you tell us because how can... you ended up where you are today, so far above the rest of us? That would be great. Uh... <laughs> wow. Uh... No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> so, actually, my story uh, uh, intersects with Balance's story. Uh, the um, P25 was one of the first things I worked on with SDR and the OP25 project. So, uh, I was a long time like system administrator, network administrator, security guy, and over the years I did more and more security, and then I totally fell into a job doing security, wireless security research at a government research lab. Uh, I have no idea how this happened. It was just dumb luck. And they needed somebody who, well, so I was working at the Boulder Labs in Colorado, and I was working for uh, ITS, the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, which is a small group of radio engineers, like less than a hundred engineers, uh, part of NTIA, the National Telecommunication and Information Administration. Uh, and most people don't know what NTIA is, but you've probably heard of the FCC. And well, here's something a lot of people don't know. The FCC does spectrum management for non-government users. NTIA does spectrum management for government users of the spectrum. There are two spectrum management agencies in the U.S., one for internal and one for external. And the internal one is NTIA. Uh, and it's also just like a policy shop, but they, but they have this research lab out in Colorado. And it's at the Boulder Labs. It shares, it shares the campus with uh, uh, NOAA and NIST. And like you've probably heard of the, the main atomic clock, the primary civilian atomic clock uh, in North America is in Boulder Labs. My, my office was right down the hall from it, and I had 10 megahertz signal from the atomic clock running through the ceiling, and I could just tap into it with, with coax. I did not know what I had at the time. Uh, <laughs> that was so awesome. Uh, so anyway, I'm working at the Boulder Labs, and they hired me just because they have a bunch of radio engineers, and they're studying radio protocols uh, and systems, and they decided that they needed a security guy. And they didn't know how to hire a security guy, so they hired me. And they <laughs> and one of the first things I worked on was looking at P25 standards and and trying to do security analysis on the protocol. Um, and I quickly found vulnerabilities. 
And I would say to people, hey, in spec, you know, 20 on page 87 or whatever, this control message is terrible. Like, it's unauthenticated, and anybody can do this, and it will destroy your radios. Uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. And, uh, and people just kind of ignored me. And they were like, yeah, kid, that's, that's great. Um, uh, How many years ago was this? Yeah. How many years ago? Uh, well, you have to realize people in the radio industry. Um, <laughs> uh, so they anyway. begin to look like this after being exposed to so much RF. Most of the yeah, most of the most of the the folks I was interacting with were you know decades older than me. But uh, but at any rate, I mean, people at least in my local lab found the stuff that I was doing interesting. We were just getting, having a hard time convincing anyone outside of our lab that some of the things I was finding were actually problems. And then uh, somebody handed me a USRP-1 uh, from Edis, you know, one of the first uh, platforms that was really uh, usable for this kind of stuff and accessible. And just kind of dropped, it just kind of fell in my lap and I said, wow, this is really cool. I could, I'm a software guy. Uh, I know like networks and operating systems and software and stuff, and I don't know radio that well, although I'm surrounded by radio engineers, and like, I could build radios with software, that's so cool. And so I started trying to do that, and I quickly found that it was very hard. I quickly found that just because I knew software didn't know, didn't mean that I knew digital signal processing. Uh, I had to learn a lot in a hurry. Um, but fortunately I was in the ideal scenario because I was surrounded by radio engineers who were like old school radio engineers who wanted to learn software defined radio. And they needed help with things like installing Linux. <laughs> so people were coming to me for help and I was learning from them in the process. So I would help them install Linux, I would help them install GNU radio, I would help them like get signals and files and software to analyze the signals and, and they would help me understand what I was doing is I was trying to explore digital signal processing. Um, uh, in particular, Dr. Robert Stafford was very much a mentor to me. Uh, he knows more about signal processing than I will probably ever know. And even though he didn't have the hands-on practical skills to like do it all with the new tools, uh, he had such an incredible knowledge of the fundamentals that when I, whenever I had a problem, he could just whiteboard out exactly what I needed to know, or blackboard out. We actually had chalkboards in the hallways. Uh, there was a lot of time in the hallways, talking to random engineers, uh, learning stuff, or sitting, you know, drawing diagrams on napkins at lunch. So I was in the perfect environment because I was coming at it from I was coming at SDR from the software side, and all and I had a hundred engineers coming at SDR from the radio side, and we were learning from each other, and I had the advantage because of the ratio. And one of the first projects I worked on was P25, and uh, demodulating P25 and decoding packets. And I was helping other engineers with their projects, some of which had nothing to do with security. Like they were working on intelligibility of the, the, the voice codec and stuff like that. You know, all kinds of different projects related to P25. And I was helping them with their DSP and their, and their, and their like actual practical transmitting and receiving stuff. And in the meantime, I was learning how to do things like spoof control channel messages. And I could go to those people that ignored me before and say, Here's what happens when somebody transmits this unauthenticated control message and it shuts down all your radios. Uh, and suddenly, it became a lot easier to talk to people and get their attention about security vulnerabilities because I was able to take theoretical vulnerabilities and turn them into practical vulnerabilities thanks to SDR. And uh, and some of my, you know, the first contributions that I made to any open source uh, SDR project were actually the OP25 project. I mean, yeah, the, the frame assembly code is in there, right? Yeah, so like uh, before any of the C++ code existed, I contributed some rudimentary packet uh, um, decoding stuff for decoding control channel messages that was all written in Python. It was, it was all like, pup, capture stuff with GNU Radio and then run it through this Python program that I wrote. And uh, I wrote the Wireshark Dissector for P25, which is still very 
uh, very much used, uh, and I don't know if anyone's actually touched it in years, but uh, like the code may still be mine. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I also eventually wrote uh, some P2, so P25 packet crafting tools, also just in pure Python. So like the main code base of OP25, I didn't have much to do with. I just made all these like ancillary tools for like crafting packets or dissecting packets and stuff like that. Uh, and it just was good timing because as I was working on this stuff myself, the OP25 project came about and I hooked up with Steve and Matt and, and just said, hey, I've got some stuff I'm working on, here you go. Uh, and so it ended up in the OP25 project. Uh, so that's my long-winded how I got into SDR. All right, Robert, you've had an question? interesting path in life. Yeah. Tell us all about how you got into Software Defined Radio and, and ended up where you're at now. So I, um, like, Back when I was in like middle school or something, I wanted to play around with like ham radio equipment. But uh, I grew up in Midtown Manhattan, so you guys can kind of imagine just like how much uh, HF propagates through concrete jungles. Nothing. So I wound <laughs> up getting like a God, I can't even remember because I didn't even play with it for that long. But it was like a ham radio, like a handheld thing. Nothing. I picked up nothing with it. So it just got tossed into the closet and it stayed there for like. I think it's still there in my parents' closet. So um, that was unfortunately a very quick end to my uh, career as a ham radio operator. So um, I started getting into like information security, and I saw like a lot of things popping up here, or there about like uh, attacks against GSM and like little embedded devices. And I'm like, oh man, that's cool. And like, I wonder what I need to do to start talking to um, these wireless devices. So I basically discovered that there's like this whole field of signal process, or like math called signal processing. So when I got to college, I pretty much just like um, got into a computer engineering program and just like did, I took a lot of uh, DSP classes, took a lot of control system classes because pretty much control systems and signal processing are like kind of like one in the same. Um, so control system classes kind of end up having a lot more uh, physical modeling aspects to it, but basically in the end like adaptive filters and feedback systems is kind of what like both uh, telecom and control systems are based off of. I mean, telecom ends up having a lot more like uh, error correction and information theory to it, but like the underlying signal processing aspect ends up kind of being similar between the two. Um, so, being a broke college kid, I never really could afford a USRP. Although I tried, I actually got a summer job to get a, to like be able to buy a USRP like between freshman and sophomore year. But um, I think I wound up getting a new video card. <laughs> so, <laughs> so mechanic play crisis. Yeah, exactly. So for like the following four or five years as a broke college kid, I was pretty much just doing everything with um, MATLAB. So I spent a lot of time doing simulations in MATLAB for a bunch of like different modems. Um, I mean, to this day, I still do a lot of stuff in MATLAB. Um, like on the flight over, I was messing around with like uh, MIMO OFDM modem. Um, and so after I graduated college, I basically just started buying as many software-defined radios as I could. And then I was like, eh, maybe I'll, I'll make one too. So that was, I guess my story's like a bit shorter, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Excellent. I'm sure you'll make up for it later. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys have uh, developed some really amazing tools and have uh, delivered them out to the world in large. What? In the community uh, that y'all have observed with the tools that y'all have developed, what sticks out to you? What has been the craziest, most wildest use or most uh, inventive use of the devices that y'all that you have seen people use or, or apply your tool towards? Any ideas? Anything stick out? It's just, you should go first. No, with you should go guys. last because yeah. your own project is going to trump anything else we come up with. <laughs> 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 um, all right, so then I guess I'll go first then. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess the craziest thing is uh, the 8 BTS thing. Um, I mean, running a GSM base station and running an LTE base station that is all completely software defined and running it on commodity ho uh, hardware is actually insane if you think about it. Like, um, one of the biggest things that we as humans do is communicate. So if you're able to have like this entire infrastructure that al costs almost nothing, and deployed in like developing nations, it will end up having a major socioeconomic impact 
on those regions. And I think the people working on BTS are like, that's like one of their driving motivations behind the project. So it's not as much a technological, like, wow, how crazy this is. I mean, it is crazy because, the, I mean, they're building GSM and LTE base stations on commodity hardware, but it's like the socioeconomic impact of the deployment of their technology that I think is going to end up having, like, crazy, far-reaching effects. So. That's cool. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm having a hard time thinking of just one, like, uber cool thing but you get two hours there <laughs> yeah if i think of one later i'll just speak up but but uh, i i really find it i mean personally what i find the most exciting thing about making something like hack rf is when i hear from people about their projects and they come to me and say oh yeah i'm doing such and such and it's an application that i never even dreamed of right like uh there's there's some researchers uh at UC San Diego who are like playing with HackRF to, in studying um, the electrical uh, sensing capabilities of sharks, uh, <laughs> the underwater electrical signals and how, how they use them to detect prey. Uh, I mean, that's crazy. I, I never thought that, I mean, it's not really a radio application, right? And so it's not something that I ever thought of HackRF being useful for, but but uh, I'm sure all of us have, have encountered things that, that are non-radio uses for SDR technology that it's really cool. Um, uh, people are using uh, uh, HackRF for uh, a lot of interesting monitoring applications and and like, HackRF isn't useful. At least a single HackRF isn't useful as a as a uh, base station. Um, but but you can use it for passive monitoring of cellular function, cellular uh, uh, you know protocols. And uh, one thing that a, a group that has been talking to me lately is working on is trying to come up with um, a software defined radio based. Uh, uh, drone platform, an unmanned aerial vehicle that's specifically used it for uh, humanitarian purposes in cases where there are refugee situations because they figure that a, a significant percentage of the refugees are carrying mobile phones and a, and a really difficult problem is tracking refugees and where they're going and where they're going to need help uh, and where to deliver aid. And so their concept for this project is to to come up with a a uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle that can fly around and detect people's cell phones and use that to track the movements of refugees and figure out where to get aid. And I, I mean, I never would have dreamed of anything like that being a. a an application of something that I built, you know, uh, and it's super cool to see uh, people coming up with with uh, such awesome applications. Our turn, I guess. Yeah, I think you get to trump everybody. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> um, I, I don't mean to, and I, I suppose I also have to add that um, you know these guys have actually produced their own hardware. I work for Edis Research. I didn't actually build the the usurp. Um, Matt Edis did, so um, I think his his sort of better qualified. I can I can speak to what um, what USEPs have been used for in the past, and I guess um, with my sort of little software contributions here and there. Um, I'm guessing you guys might be alluding to the space probe. <laughs> um, and and the thing is, I mean, if you talk about the the hum humanitarian side of things, that always trumps everything. But um, it was you know pretty cool hooking up a, a software defined radio to the biggest radio telescope and, and it was probably the biggest antenna with the most amount of power that, that has ever been amplified up from, a, from an SDR before to reach a 36-year-old space probe that was 15.3 million kilometers away, which is a two-way round-trip light time of, I think, 105 seconds. Wow. Um, so, you know, if you think, if you think about the, the scales involved and, and, um, and, and everything, it was, it was pretty wild. And the, and the fact that, you know, it's a testament to the the engineering of the subcontractors and NASA design as well, that after that period of time, at least the communication system on board and the power as well, was still still operating. Uh, there's no computer as such on board, it's just a series of discrete 
um, sort of larger logic gates and shift registers and so on. Um, and I think that's what contributed to the longevity of, of the space probe. Unfortunately, of course, the pressure is gone, but whatever. It was still, it was still good. Um, and I suppose that that's a testament to how amazingly flexible SDR is. You know, obviously the guys saw that NASA had thrown out all the gear originally, so we just used GNU Radio to, to put together some software to, to talk to it. Um, I suppose to, to build on, on your point regarding base stations, um, you know, Open Media has been around for quite... We're getting complaints about noise, I apologize. Here you go. Okay. Um, some time and, and I was just chatting with, um, with someone about this, but who knows um, Fabrice Bellard, he's, he's the French genius and he's, we wrote QEMU and FMPEG and, and one of my favorite projects that I think is lesser known is he created a DVB-T modulator that had the signal output on the red pin of his VGA card. So he wrote all the software and then he would modulate the signal and then it would only work on a single frequency but he hooked it up to his set-top box and what do you know, Lino would appear on his, on his screen. Um, he just appeared out of the blue because, of course, he, he just jumps around. He's, he's an incredible guy. And he turned out to have written a full LT base station running on, a, on an N210. Um, and he sort of got in touch with us and I helped him over the, the course of several months kind of make it work on, on, the, on the B210. And it runs, you know, 2x2 two two MIMO. And this is just, this is a bus powered thing. You just plug into your laptop, launch your software, and then you have a, a full LT base station. And then I had another laptop with a dongle and plugged it in and was surfing the internet. And, you know, this came out from one guy. And if you consider the, the complexity of the code that he wrote, particularly the, the turbo decoders, this is usually done on, on very, um, you know, fast parallel hardware like FPGAs. He wrote it all for general purpose computing, which is insane. He's, he's amazing. So that, that blew my mind. Um, if you look at the entire spectrum, I mean, there are so many different applications. Down at HF, you have, you know, various sort of um, long range packet based uh, links. Um, you have other other um, applications where where they're used as, as ground stations to talk to sort of low Earth orbit satellites, not just space probes, and, and you know replace really expensive equipment that's otherwise used. Um, you don't even have to necessarily hook it up to an antenna. You can hook it up to some other industrial system and, and sample stuff uh, like at, at power stations or at cyclotrons and. Um, you know, further up, you can you can sniff Wi-Fi packets if you want to look further down into the raw RF. Um, you know, the, the list goes on. If if more come to mind, we can we can certainly yeah. discuss discuss. I have, a, I have a quick follow-up question. Red, VGA, red. Why did he choose red? Um, and not blue or green. It's the first one on the list. Yeah. Is that the only reason? Could the be. reason I ask. Oh, really? Really? Oh, I didn't yeah, think there's a single did. VGA. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So anyway, the reason I ask is that uh, in the that's all right. I'm, you guys can hear me in the back, right? I'm super loud. So uh, the the reason I I just sort of keyed into that red. Oh yeah, because uh, I'm doing the the NSA playset stuff. And in, in making a VGA RF retro reflector, I was looking at the one that the NSA uses. Spoiler alert, uh, leaked classified information. Uh, there's <laughs> the NSA ant catalog actually says they tap the red pin on the VGA signal. Yeah. Because, and they specifically say that call out the red pin is the one that empirically gives them the best return. Yeah. That, yeah. And I, I always thought that that had something to do with, with like, Something to do with the the uh, the fonts that they're trying to read, or like the anti-aliasing, or like subpixel something related to that. I'm like, why is red better than any of the others? I don't. Most text is black on white or white on black, so why would the color matter? But anyway, you said red, and I was like, wait, maybe it's, yeah. maybe it's related. I don't know. Well, I, I think in this case, he probably just picked it because it was the first. Because I mean, he's using it to transmit, so you yeah. can pick any of them. But but I mean, that was a good point regarding the red because I remember reading the, the, that catalog too. And I, I mean. I'm guessing it's because if you were to pick any of the three, you know, three of the, the triple, then if you want to make out any sort of grayscale content or any color content, then for some reason red gives you the most perceptible recreation of whatever your color image yeah. was somehow prior to that. for some reason. Yeah. Magic. Well, <laughs> we can try it.
So if I could actually back you up just a little bit to uh, the, the part of the story you were telling earlier. You mentioned kind of that you were you were using a very large antenna, a really big amplified antenna, and that, that it was something that was 105 light seconds away, but you didn't really go into what you were actually controlling. I know everybody up here was uh, following along pretty well, but I, I don't know if the whole the whole room knows exactly what you were controlling, and g given the fact that it was kind of cool, maybe you could give us a little bit of details on what you were controlling, aside from just the electronics on board. <laughs> okay, um, so th just over 36 years ago, NASA launched um, the ISEE-3 space probe. It's the um, it, they sent it out. It did a number of firsts. It flew flew by a comet, um, and it went into the first halo orbit around the sun. Um, was positioned at the L1 Lagrange point between the Earth and the sun, so it would track through that orbit, uh, and. You know, it, it, it was a very it was a very successful mission. It was launched with another two probes, and eventually, you know, funding ran out. The mission came to a conclusion, and they just sort of left it to the graveyard of space. But it was on this interesting sort of curlicued orbit that would follow around um, the, the similar orbit to the Earth. And every so often, it comes back to the Earth to do a lunar flyby, which is actually doing either today or tomorrow. And um, some some guys, actually quite late in the game, I think in April. Um, found that some German hams um, in AMSAT, the German AMSAT people, actually had used a large dish and had found the transponder signal, the carrier, um, coming down and they were able to see it was just above the noise floor. It was confirmation that it was still out there and it was still working. The batteries have long since died, so it's just purely powered by, by the solar. Uh, the solar panels, and the and this team, private team, got together and they thought, well, maybe if we can talk to NASA and and figure out how to talk to the space probe, we can actually transmit to it, wake it up, turn telemetry back on, see what state it's in, and then potentially fire the thrusters, assuming there's sufficient fuel left on board, and change its trajectory. So instead of flying by the Earth, we can bring it back into orbit around the Earth. And there are, I think, 11 or, or more science instruments on board. And they're all been shut down, but we could turn them back on and actually get legitimate science back down. And, and there are interesting things. Actually, it was quite funny. Yesterday, um, a little bit after your talk, I, um, I had been speaking with my, one of my colleagues, and one of the scientists said, we need to reboot one of the experiments. And um, so we needed to, to actually send commands to the satellite. And, and of course, I needed to get online here. And, and I connected to the open Wi-Fi. And, and the guy saying, Anders, are you here? By, yeah, there he is. What a champ. He said, get off that quickly, even though I was going to use SSH. So I got off. And, and this incredibly kind, good Samaritan gentleman actually um, tethered with his AT&T, because T-Mobile is crap in here. Um, and so, you know, I SSH'd in and, and was, was sharing with my colleague, and, and we re rebooted the experiment from, from uh, the Penn and Teller theater. So that, that, was, that was pretty neat. Um, he reconfigured a satellite from DEF CON. Is that not going to clap? <laughs> Um, so that's all quite easy now because it's very close to the Earth. But but when we started out, uh, there was some pressure, because time pressure, because we weren't sure how much fuel was left. And as time would go on, it would the the amount of fuel that was necessary, the delta V to change the traje trajectory, would increase asymptotically. So we needed to get get that done asap. And um, and the guys managed to talk to the people at Arecibo. We went down there and and used that big dish because it's got such incredible gain. How big is it? Um, it's it's 300 meters. 300. Yeah, it's a thousand feet, 300 meters. Yeah, it's a little bit. And and a, a kilometer um, in circumference. Wow. Um, so it's you know if you've seen James Bond or Contact, that's that's the one. Um, and in Puerto Rico. So it was bringing that down to us. James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> Actually, we got there, and I think the first or second night. Um, my friend had rented Goldeneye, and we watched the end of it just to see which ones, which scenes had been shot there, and which ones had used the model, and so on. Because um, you can't actually get like get on a skateboard; it's a, it's a mesh thing. Um, and if like a bolt or a nut falls off the the platform, they say you have to wear hard hats when you go out there. Um, but it's it's kind of a moot point because by the time that bolt reaches your head, it's accelerated to such a speed that it'll actually go right through your helmet and go into your head and kill you. Uh, if you don't, it, it will, right, so rather it will break your neck because the, the hard hat might might contain the, the thing, wow. but it, it'll break your neck. So you can either leave it on, have your neck broken, or take it off and just have have the bullet the bullet. It's essentially a bullet by that point go through your head. 
Anyway, we managed to pick up the transponder. Uh, we had a custom power amplifier built by a German guy, 450 watts. He tested up to 650, I think. So we hooked that up, and that was in the dome, and, and they hooked it up to their existing waveguide so that it could bounce through the, the reflectors and out, out into the universe. Um, and you know, they, they tracked the thing, and we sent it up, and the, the telemetry came on, and we started decoding it. If you're familiar with uh, Phil Kahn, he's a legend in the community, and, and he um, wrote the, the world record of, of the Turby decoder for this particular um, convolutional code. And, um, and yeah, we, we looked at the telemetry, and then later on we tried to um, fire the thrusters and make sure everything was right, but it turned out that the, the nitrogen that pushes the fuel out has somehow disappeared. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did you guys have to ask NASA or anything? If you could control their satellite or like what? Yeah, yeah. So it, we, we didn't just go out independently and, and do it all. Um, before I joined the team, they had sort of established um, a dialogue and, and a fair few of the guys uh, uh, formerly of NASA. Um, and they had contacts and, and uh, a NASA space agreement was officially signed. Okay. Uh, I think it was even retweeted by the White House or something. And, um, and so there was, the, yeah, that was all set up and, and we have to, it's interesting actually, I was thinking as you brought up the NTIA, uh, we, we've actually, well, I mean, you know, the, the co-leads have been coordinating with them oh, yeah. to get um, the frequency licenses to transmit at each of the sites. Right. So we put in that request and they process it and they can say, yes, you can transmit at these frequencies between these time periods. Um, but yeah, and, and a lot of the documentation was actually scattered as well. So they had to do a lot of NASA dumpster diving to find all the old docs and piece them together. And there's a lot of stuff that was missing, so it needed a lot of you know eyes to pour over it and make, tease out all the, all the details. But it sort of it came together in the end. So it's credit to them. Uh, I'm honestly still kind of at reconfigured a satellite from DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, Weak question, I guess, because I'm, I'm seriously still stuck on that. Uh, we had talks earlier today of, of kind of things that you've been working on fairly recently from, from all three of you, interesting developments that you've been working on, some, some neat stuff that was shown. I think I saw Balin's head upside down on a wave diagram. It was kind of, kind of neat. Was that, was, was that your head or somebody else's head? Um, that, was, that was actually um, last year. It's, it's an artifact from last year. Um, that was actually Matt Edis. Um, my, my boss, uh, way back, way back in uni, I thought it'd be cool to um, take a, a bitmap, like a photo of my friends, and synthesize um, some some audio, and then use a spectrogram, and you could just record it, and their their face would appear. Aphex Twin did it for one of yes. his videos, yep. it, and that was wild. Um, and then going from audio to RF, I thought naturally, well, you could apply it here. And so um, last year at, at the GNU Radio conference. I did this little little promo thing for one of our other devices, and it sort of has the logo and then the text, and then and then Matt's sort of head scroll up, and it just continually goes. But the idea is, you know, you pop in any image, and you can just you can overlay it onto the spectrum. Um, so you need to run like a, a waterfall, and you'll see interesting stuff come up. So as it turns out, it takes the Wireless Village staff just over an hour and 15 minutes to hijack that and put something else up, because we were totally unprepared to do that, so he had unfortunately turned his off by the time we figured out how to hijack it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we were that close. <laughs> we were that and, close. And, and, and I cornered you afterwards, and I was glad to know that we were on the right track. Yeah. We were so close. <laughs> So yeah, so there, there, there are a bunch of talks. They're, they're going to be up on the website and recorded, so I don't, I don't want to rehash all of the fun stuff, but that one fell off the end, so the explanation's fun. Um, so what's next? You guys have been working on those things, but what's, what's the ideas kind of rolling around in your head right now that uh, I, I'm, I'm asking for a sneak preview of the people that are they're doing all the fun stuff. So. The pre-published stuff that keeps you up at night. Yeah, the, the things that keep you up at night, you're wondering, like, I want to do this. Do I have the free time? And since we've gone uh, this direction a few times, Robert, your turn, buddy. Oh, man. So the thing that keeps me up at night is uh, <laughs> hardware accelerated channel impulse response estimators. Oh, that's easy. That's yeah. terrible. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Explain why they keep what? you up at night. Come on. Because uh, <laughs> basically doing them in fixed point arithmetic and HDL, uh, I can't. I don't really know how to account for like bus widths appropriately, so then I end up getting uh, overflows, like implicit overflows in some of my registers, and uh, my algorithms just explode in my face. So floating point works in MATLAB, but fixed point arithmetic and HDL does not. I think I might need to implement some sort of uh, overflow control in uh, some of the arithmetic in the HDL. 
So. So while you're all wondering if you should grab that extra snack, this is what this man is thinking of when he goes to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Go so, ahead, Mike. Uh, Mike? Yep, yep. Uh, what keeps me up at night is shipping. <laughs> <laughs> you mean customs? <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Customs <laughs> that, that, yeah. So, you know, as many of you know, HackRF just shipped this week to Kickstarter backers. <laughs> and, uh, it's going to ship very, very soon, like in a couple weeks, uh, to people who have placed orders post Kickstarter. The post Kickstarter pre orders. Uh, and so, you know, just getting to that point and getting it available to people on a regular basis is what keeps me up at night lately. Um, but that's kind of a cop out. That's not, a, that's not what you're looking for. No, uh, but it was fun, so I appreciate it. But it's that. what actually <laughs> keeps me up at night. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, then what keeps you from spending me, more man. time with your wife? What? what? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, like, the thing that I'm kind of working on lately, kind of the, the next big project for me, uh, which is inspiring um, to you know ha have some of you come up and, and say you watched my videos. Um, I, I kind of make them to, to spread the word and so, show the cool things that, that you can do. I have so many flow graphs on my laptop that were just sort of experiments and sort of proofs of various things. I'd love to share them all. And there are only so many hours in the day, and, and so I'd like to try and prioritize them and, and do a bit more of that because um, they're helpful for me, and I, I therefore hope they would be helpful for other people. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, you might have seen the stuff I was doing with primary radar. That was just with an omnidirectional antenna. I'd love to go back and, and, and use a directional antenna. Um, the, the newer USERP can do two channels, um, and it would be nice to have one channel the omni, so that's what the software would sync to. The other channel would actually be the directional antenna pointed at an airport, so that maybe you could get a ping off an aircraft. And then you can actually calculate the Doppler shift to get some idea of the speed of the bird and sort of recreate your own full passive system. Um, so that's, that's something I like to look at. Uh, another thing which, which Michael um, hit on the head there was, was the fact that with these incredible bandwidths that you can process now, like um, you know, with, with the new use of X300, it does 200 mega samples per second. That's 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth. Um, you need to be able to process that somehow in real time. And it, although you can ship it across 10 gig e to a, a computer, the computer that needs to be incredibly powerful and so on. So the, the trick then is to move stuff into the FPGA. Um, so you know, being able to, to create a nice tool flow to enable people to do that, because you know, FPGAs are, are hard. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, and so creating some sort of an architecture to, to enable people to sort of muck around with that a little easier is, is something that um, the team's working on. And one of my other little pet projects that I've, I've done is kind of, actually last time I was in Vegas, I brought, and this is purely for, for a holiday to go to the Grand Canyon and stuff. I, I brought an X300 and a, and a B200 and I set them up in the car and I was driving around Vegas with antennas coming out of the roof. And I, I'd written a spectrum monitoring scanning application, so it would just sweep the entire spectrum, um, dump it to my SSD, run the FFTs, and then you could stitch them together to get this ridiculously wide FFT to see where all the signals were. Uh, and that's something I'm still working on. But the problem was that when you do a, like million point FFTs on your CPU, it takes a while. <laughs> but you can do that very, very quickly on an FPGA. So that's something I, one of the projects I'm, I'm, I'm going to be working on. Um, and, then, and then beyond that, you know, the, the future is also about miniaturization. Uh, and, um, and so you, know, you, can, you can have very small embedded products, uh, hint, hint. <laughs> and um, the, the trick will be to kind of get lots of cool intensive stuff moved onto the FPGA in this maybe future potential device coming out very soon. Sorry for the shameless plug. Um, <laughs> and and um, do really cool stuff with that. As long as the plug stays shameless, it's okay. Yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> so yeah, that's some of it. So guys, uh, as you all probably have seen, one of the many challenges for people getting into STR is that the instructions for this sort of stuff is kind of like uh, from a slide I had the other day for instructions of drawing an L, have two concentric circles and then draw the rest of the damn L. Um, so in regards to learning about STR and not having to go back to college to get your electrical engineering degree or so, uh, in, in, like having to learn a whole bunch of other things, what would be your best recommendation for people to kind of accelerate 
their knowledge and application of uh, these tools, uh, analyzing protocols, reverse engineering, and all that sort of stuff. Maybe are any of you planning on doing like a really long YouTube training segment on this? <laughs> I, I, I wonder who not promise something. Yeah, from, uh, that, that, that would be a like, good that idea. Would be real, that, that would be awesome. I, I wonder think, if anybody would do that. I think maybe all of us. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Hey, someone can lock the doors and we can do it now. <laughs> So how do people right. learn this stuff? So personally, like I, I've been giving a two-day SDR training for years now. Uh, I give it at Tourcon, I give it at Black Hat, I give it at Troopers in, in uh, Germany and occasionally other places. And uh, uh, you know, I, I come from the security community and I, I try to take a security angle on my training uh, and, and try to show people specifically how SDR is useful for uh, wireless security research and those types of things, but but I uh, but really what it ends up being is a lot of DSP fundamentals. Uh, you can't get away from you have to learn DSP to be able to learn SDR. Uh, you, I mean, you could kind of skip DSP and learn how to do one thing with SDR, but that doesn't get you any that doesn't do you any good when you want to do something else with SDR. You you need those DSP fundamentals to to be to have the to take advantage of the flexibility that SDR gives you, and so uh, and so I've been promising people for about a year now that uh, I'm going to come up with an online video series of uh, that's kind of based on my SD my two day SDR class, uh, and I have been working on it, um, and I have I'm probably going to be actually publishing videos like in about a week. We'll hold you to it. So, but <laughs> but they will come out in installments. So it's going to be like an intro video, and then another video, and then another. It'll probably be months before I really have my whole course uh, represented. But on the other hand, it's an opportunity to go into a little bit more depth than I can fit into two days. So even though uh, it'll take a while to get to all that content. Uh, along the way, I'll hopefully be able to, to uh, make it a little bit more in depth and a little let people take their time with it a little bit more than they're able to do in my uh, two day class. Do you have a question, Mike? Yeah. Are there any single project books that you recommend? Ooh, that's a good, oh, yeah, question. That's a good question. Are there any? Should we? Should I go ahead? No, I'm saying repeat the question. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. The question is, are there any signal processing books that I recommend? Uh, so I have. I want to. I want to recommend three books in particular. Uh, book number one is Practical Signal Processing by Mark Owen. A lot of people haven't heard of this book, but it's awesome. Practical Signal Processing by Mark Owen. Uh, this is the book that I recommend to anyone who's getting started with signal processing. Uh, one of the things I like about it is that he introduces complex numbers on page seven. Uh, <laughs> a lot of other authors will avoid complex numbers until like the end of the book and stick it in an appendix. And I think that's the wrong approach, especially for SDR, and especially if you want to use GNU Radio, where the default data type for most of the workhorse blocks you use is complex. You really need to conceptualize that and get used to that right away, and Mark Owen helps people do that. He also has the most amazing description of how the FFT works. I mean, like, I kind of knew how the FFT worked before I read his book, but after I read his book, I wrote an FFT in Python in like 20 lines of code. Uh, it was amazing. So uh, I don't even think it was 20 lines of code. It, I mean, it was like, wow, now I really get it. So Mark Owen, uh, incredible. Uh, second book I recommend is the one that Jared is holding up in the back of the room, and he talked about it in his talk earlier, uh, Understanding Signal Processing by Richard Lyons. This book is uh, it's recommended constantly as the best introduction to DSP by people who haven't read Mark Owen. Um, <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. But I don't like it as an intro as much as I like Owen's book. Uh, however, it's totally worth picking up. It has a lot of good stuff in it. And it's worth buying just for chapter 13. Chapter 13, Signal Processing Tricks. And as, as Jared mentioned in his Porta Pack talk earlier, like the stuff he's doing on the ARM CPU on the Hack RF, like that really limited CPU, he's able to do this cool SDR stuff. The reason he's able to do that is because of chapter 13, signal processing tricks. <laughs> uh, and then the third book I want to mention, 
Oh, the second book's title is Understanding Digital Signal Processing by Richard Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S. Uh, get the third edition. Uh, the yeah, get the third edition. I only have the second edition, uh, which is much better than the first. Like, like chapter 13 is twice as big. But, uh, <laughs> but get the third edition. Uh, and then the third book I want to mention is, I think it's called Software Receiver Design. If you guys, I don't know if you guys have seen this one, but it's, it's a blue book. Johnson and Satharis and Klein. Uh, now, I haven't actually read all the way through it, but I read through a, a predecessor book. Like, the, the previous version of it had a different title. And I read through that one, and I found it very helpful uh, during my, er, the earlier part of my SDR career. Uh, and it's, um, it specifically like goes through all the steps you need to create a complete uh, like transmitter and receiver. Uh, and they focus on the receiver. And as anyone who knows SDR will tell you, that makes sense because the receiver is the hard part. Like if you understand building receivers, then building transmitters is obvious. If you understand building transmitters, you'll have no clue how to build receivers. So, so focusing on receivers makes sense. And their book is a, um, a series of exercises for MATLAB. Uh, I did it all in Octave, which is a uh, open source alternative to MATLAB. And now MATLAB isn't my favorite, uh, MATLAB and Octave, but it was effective for, for the book, for learning. Uh, one thing I don't like about the book is it's one of those that kind of puts off introducing complex numbers for as long as possible, uh, which I think actually complicates your understanding of it rather than make, making it easier to understand. That's just my personal opinion, especially if you're going to use GNU Radio. Uh, so uh, that's just my personal take on it, but, they, but the things that they address, the concepts that they introduce are uh, like pulse shaping filters, for example, for digital communication, are things that you won't see in a general purpose DSP book. So it's good to have some exposure to that stuff. Do you guys want to add anything? Are any books I'm overlooking that you yes. are favorites of yours? Um, discrete signal processing, or discrete time signal processing by uh, uh, Oppenheim. Oh, yeah, um, that's like Schaefer. a classic textbook. Yeah, it's like one of those textbooks that will take you like about a year to go through. Yeah, uh, it's like this thick, about a thousand pages, <laughs> and. Uh, about like 10 pages worth of problems for every chapter, and there's like about 23 chapters, and it's like proofs for everything. Like there's a proof for the FFT, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, there's a question over here, I think. Uh, nobody's written a good book for getting started with GNU Radio. Thanks for volunteering. Yeah, <laughs> we have a volunteer. <laughs> You, uh, you should maybe check out the the GR tutorial stuff that was posted. Recently. Oh yeah, yeah. So Good. the GNU Radio people have have sort of come together and, and created a bunch of different tutorials that are on the website in, in particular. I think it's just called GR tutorial, and they go through um, in, a, in a number of different sort of stages um, a general sort of introduction to to how to put things together. So so check that out. Any recommendations for somebody to just jump in and pick up a piece of hardware to just start poking around with? And yeah, see pick it. up hardware and poke around. I mean, like, <laughs> I, since all three of these guys have their own hardware, I'm going to go the other way and tell you that you can buy a $20 RTL SDR over in the vendor area and you can start up on that because, honest to God, this stuff is really awesome for a lot of people and really impossible and unpleasant for some people. I mean, people in the Wi-Fi village go and they grab a Wi-Fi card and they put it into monitor mode and bam, here's packets. You do SDR and you get a cute little waveform and I'd say 99% of the people that first look at that have no idea what it is. And after a while, it's, it's really awesome, but you definitely want to ease yourself into a hobby like this because uh, it could definitely go from really, really cheap to really, really expensive. And granted, your, your capabilities will increase as that happens, but before all of these guys plug their individual hardware is the best, which I was waiting for, uh, I, I highly recommend starting with an RTL SDR because you'll, you'll know real quick if you like it or not, and if you don't, it was 20 bucks. <laughs> And I'd bolt on to that, get your ham radio operator's license. Mm. Yeah, I, on that point in particular, um, I'm a, an Australian ham, 
uh, and I got my foundation, so I'm Victor Kilo 2, Foxtrot Uniform, November Kilo. And the only reason why I got it was for when the police would turn up, I would have a, a you know, government, government license just to diffuse the situation a little bit. Because, you know, I was driving around Sydney with, with these suction caps on the, on the top of my roof with these homemade antennas and stuff. And, and you know, anyway. Um, but actually, on, on your point of the RTL, before I actually moved from Sydney um, to work at Edis, I got involved in RTL in a big way. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it's cool. Um, and I think if you're going to ease into this hobby, then, then the first thing you do is you plug it in and you look at the radio spectrum and you get a sense of what sort of signals are actually out there. And then you don't even have to go about necessarily demodulating them or, or getting down to the raw bits. You can use a lot of sort of existing programs like GQRX is pretty cool. It runs on top of GNU Radio and on OS X and, and um, on Linux. Um, you can use HDSDR, and I wrote a plugin for that that does RTL, does FunCube, does Usurp, and some other stuff. Um, but it's just basically exploring the spectrum and getting a sense of this natural resource that's regulated by the government. People are sending this mysterious radio energy out on. And then you do a bit of research online, whether it be with the FCC or in Australia, we have our own regulatory body, but looking up frequencies and exploring, you know, who is licensed where and what equipment it's licensed for and what they might be sending over the airwaves, just to kind of get a sense of who uses what where and then and then you might get a better idea of, of what signals you want to focus on you know and 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 um, where you want to want to go from there and I think just to add to the previous point quickly um, those are all you know excellent books but I think from from personal experience I don't have a DSP background so I just kind of have picked this stuff up as I've gone along and I think um, open source tools like Octave are fantastic the other one I love is, is um, NumPy and Matplotlib. It has a lot of um, accelerated um, math functions that you can use. I mean, I, I use NumPy all the time. It's, it's, and it's really, really cool. You can produce beautiful plots and do all sorts of really nice processing. Um, and in terms of GNU Radio, whenever I would get to the stage of trying to understand some new stuff, it's really just about finding the time to sit down and just, just start with some really basic uh, simulation of what you're trying to do. Like, for example, I'd never looked at the, the equalizers that are actually implemented there. There are three of them, um, and I'd never really used equalizers before, and equalizers are important when you have some sort of a channel through which your data is flowing, and you want to sort of model the channel response so that your decoder will perform better. And um, actually recently what I did was I hacked on the code a little bit, and one of the, the filters there actually has a filter and it has some taps that are sort of changed as, as it senses your channel. So I added some Python code with NumPy and matplotlib that would actually take the taps out, do a transform, and then I would have a live plot of the frequency response of the channel. And I'd move the radios apart and see how that would change. Uh, and so just doing these sorts of really simple little experiments to get your head around, like, like the FFT. I remember when the FFT first clicked with me, it's like a revelation. You have this epiphany and think, wow, that's, that's wild. You know, Fourier was, a, was the man. But, <laughs> but you know, you, you, there's, there's nothing stopping you from this incredibly flexible framework of just placing down a couple of blocks and just iteratively adding little bits and pieces to, to, to make sure that you fully understand what's going on. Yeah. I don't so, know if everybody yeah. had a chance to answer your initial question uh, about educational resources, video, video, online stuff. I was actually just going to continue, so uh, okay. don't look behind you here, gave a, a fabulous introduction to SDR talk, and uh, it, he included quite a few resources, so definitely watch the talk now, because we're not going to repeat everything, but uh, radioreference.com is a really great resource for, I found this signal, I wonder who on earth has registered to it, they actually have found frequencies and the FCC filings of frequencies and things like that. Uh, the other one's actually the FCC's website. If you've got something in your hand and you're trying to figure out desperately, what on earth is this? I know it transmits because my car door opens, but I don't know how it works. On the back of like every single licensed transmitter ever built is a little FCC ID. And there's a lookup page on their website that has diagrams of the inside so you don't have to take it apart yourself. It tells you all about the transmitter properties, all about what frequencies it's on, how it works, and that'll definitely get you a, a long way. And Mike Ryan is begging to say something, please. 
Oh, oh, yeah, FCC.io is, is apparently way better, so I, I'm learning things here too. And what was the one that helps you identify the signals? So the, uh, uh, some of the resources I've been out uh, trying to address is just that situation of, I want to get into this, what do I do? And uh, shame on me because of uh, having to do a lot of this stuff. I bought the domain name sdr.ninja. I've kind of a basic placeholder there uh, for like uh, taking the resources that are from Edis, uh, Blade, and uh, Great Scott. All the stuff that I've seen people do and just try to put it all in one place because there's a lot of these other websites that just focus on one of those tools or one of those functions. And it's kind of one of those situations of you don't want to be hitting like uh, 30 different websites in a day to see the latest, greatest thing. I'm trying to do that for you. So, so far what I have on it is just like the basic one-on-one -on -one stuff of uh, everything from uh, the signal identification wiki, uh, because your brains are the best SDR for immediate uh, identification of some of the common signals that are out there, uh, to some of the additional resources. I'm going to add those books that y'all mentioned. Uh, uh, that would be fantastic. But even from hardware, other uh, references, the re uh, subreddit over um, uh, RTLSDR uh, is a very active uh, community. Uh, it's constantly growing. So stuff like that. There are these like little oases uh, all across the internet, and it's 100% spot on to everyone's point so far in regards to like where where's the one spot. So I'm I'm trying to do that. Another thing I just thought of: there is a book list on the GNU Radio website. I don't know if it's been updated recently, but I know there's some good stuff on there. Uh, and, and as Balant mentioned earlier, uh, there are those GNU Radio tutorials that are, you know, so far and a huge improvement that those are available. Overall, the, the documentation for GNU Radio and the, the wiki uh, has improved a whole lot in recent history. There's a lot there. What's that? Pi bombs is awesome. It, it really is. Yeah, it's a, a tool for helping you install all the software you need. Yeah, it's like AppGet or um, Yum, but for getting radio. Yeah. Definitely not a merge for. <laughs> yeah, so definitely when I first started trying to package GNU Radio, it was one of the most horrible things in my life. And now, thanks to me and several other people who begged them for help so often that they had to write good docs for us all, I, I didn't help them in any way. Don't I just begged for help until they actually wrote it down properly. So it's all very well documented these days. And even better, uh, the latest Git releases of GNU Radio have all kinds of fixes to the build system, so no longer can you actually say, I want to build this, and then it just silently drops it or explodes halfway through the compile, so like all the random compiler failures are now actually headed off at the pass when it says, oh, you're actually missing this lib, instead of bombing out and you having to search for why on earth doesn't this work. So the the reason that Pybombs and Build GNU Radio and these scripts existed was because it was so atrocious before, and they've been working really hard on that, and they've done a very good job and I'm, I'm really excited about the next point release that actually has all of those things in it. But the, the Git repo, which the vast majority of you gentlemen follow, I'm certain, has, has an awful lot of build fixes, which make life a lot easier for people getting started, which is great. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a big credit to the community as a whole. I mean, I've said before that the community is, is really quite widespread and very vibrant, and, and there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on. So I think it's, um, it's great to see that. And, 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 you know, with people like yourself, when, when they pester and, and so on, that's exactly what, what, what we need to get, you know, get our asses in the gear. Yeah, if you look, actually, you'll find that almost every SDR-related application has a tag right in, like, mid-July, and then they have another tag next year in, like, mid-July. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's because uh, some of us beg an awful lot for good software to take the DEF CON. <laughs> Like a flow graph. Yeah, wh why don't you guys all have your flow graphs in GitHub instead of on a folder, I think is what the question yeah. was. <laughs> because even if they're not clean, at least we could find them. Yeah. I, th I think for me anyway, the, the concern is I often like, you know, do a lot of patches in GNU Radio and then it takes a little while for them to get merged and so on. So I'm afraid if I, if I release them, people will get it and then it will naturally not work. And then people say, what the hell, and so on. Yeah. And then it's just, you know, everything moves so quickly, you've got to move on to the next thing and it just it, it, it goes on the backboard. And that's actually a problem for GNU Radio Companion in general. 
And like, e even if you're not hacking on GNU Radio itself uh, and you're just using it, um, there's a lot of uh, people who do publish flow graphs, uh, .grc files, which are XML files describing the flow graphs. Uh, people who do publish those, uh, you'll often find that when you download one, it doesn't work because of version-to-version -version compatibility problems. And so you'll be like, whoa, I just downloaded this file and I open it up in GRC and like it's missing half the blocks. What happened? Uh, yep. It's it's a well, we yep. just had just that like happen like two, two days, days ago, ago, right? So, yeah. So <laughs> this happens all the time, and it's it's something that should be better in the future with the changes that GNU Radio is, has made in recent history with the three seven namespace that like hopefully was the namespace change to end all, all namespace spaces. changes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, none of us are core GNU Radio developers, but. We know them, and we hassle them a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> like, uh, the uh, it, it, hopefully in the future that'll become it'll become easier to share flow graphs uh, and make them uh, uh, more forward compatible. Uh, but historically, that's been a problem. And I think if if there's one sort of classic resource that people recommend, it's. Um, I mean, it probably needs a bit of updating and, and refreshing, but uh, CGRAN, it's, it's the, you know, CGRAN.org. Uh, quite a few really neat projects are sort of listed there, and, and it's, it's a good um, sort of categorization of the different sorts of SDR apps you can use. Uh, one resource that I wanted to point out that I've like really relied on quite a bit uh, recently has been uh, dsplog.com. Yeah. It's um, this one dude's blog of like a bunch of different projects that he's worked on basically since like 2006 or something. And uh, I'm like, wow, these are really great. I wonder what this dude's doing right now. It turns out he's like a staff like architect at Qualcomm or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, DSP log. L O G, D S P L O G, yeah. You know, we should probably just share our bookmarks and put them up on our website. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we would be happy to post those on on the notes for this talk. That would be just fine. So feel free to send whatever you'd like, and we'll add it to the. Please, this is your reading list. Because <laughs> there actually is a lot of really good sort of niche information out there that people published in their own little posts and stuff. It's just a matter of finding time, sitting down, and you know, like, Google is your friend. It would be nice if everything was, I mean, like, that's great to hear that's that you're I'm putting, to yeah. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. Just got to find it. Do you guys have any uh, Come closer. Yeah, come closer, please. Can't hear you. Good. So the question is on ultra wideband. What interests you, and can you make it work? Um, you don't mean ultra wideband, the standard per se, the, the the dead standard. You just mean really high bandwidth stuff, yeah. Um, I think, like the the spectrum monitoring certainly, um, and just doing any sort of in, ingestion of of. Um, you know, channel hopping over incredible bandwidth. I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is what you're talking about before. Um, uh, with the radar stuff, I mean, that takes up a lot of bandwidth. So that the higher you go, the, the potentially the, the better resolution you can get from that. Um, and and I guess the challenge of just being able to process a huge amount of data, you know, whether it be Wi-Fi or, or what have you. I know my colleagues are working on um, Wi-Fi 802.11a implemented on the FPGA, for example. Um, and so, you know, you've got 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth to play with. You can have multiple encoders and decoders and what have you. So, so that's that's one thing. Uh, for me, like the, the biggest, widest band application that, that I've attempted or expect to attempt in the near future is what I talked about earlier with all channel Bluetooth monitoring. Uh, but that isn't even ultra wide band, it's just wider than most of the tools we use day to day, you know. Uh, and so, uh, you know, beyond 100 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, I haven't really thought about too much, personally. Next. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, well, one thing that interests me is like high bandwidth, like digital bandwidth kind of links. So instead of going out and, I mean, if you want to, the difference between consuming about, I don't know, like 10, 20, 50, and 100 megahertz is just like with OFDM, it's more sub carriers. So it's, that's in HDL or in MATLAB or anything, that's just like a single generic that you change. Like that's a variable that you change. But I think the really cool thing is MIMO, like MIMO OFDM. Like instead of using more spectrum out horizontally, you just like stack things on top of one another. So then um, basically with like 3x3 three three MIMO or 4x4 four four MIMO, like a 5 megahertz bandwidth can end up actually being the cool like 15 or 20 megahertz worth of total bandwidth. Yeah. And the cool thing about MIMO is that there's like kind of like security implications to it too, that people with fewer receivers than you have transmitters can't actually listen to you because uh, the matrix ends up being uh, underdefined. So I think, I think it's really cool having like a bunch of transmitters transmitting at the same time and having a bunch of receivers receiving at the same time and then somehow magically just like all these like phasers line up in such a way that you're able to reconstruct each transmit or each transmitter individually with each receiver. So. And yeah, we're, we're messing around with some of that stuff now. That's a tricky question. <laughs> are you are you referring to to the, the particular instances apart from the FFT? Oh, you, shall I describe it now? Then is that is that what you're asking? All right. Well, imagine imagine you have a whole bunch of samples in the time domain, and you basically create a sine wave of all the different frequencies you can fit in that in that window. You basically go through each of them, and then you you see what the response is of that sine wave. Basically, how how much of that sine wave is contained within the samples you've re recorded, and that's effectively the, your bin magnitude for that sine wave. And you just go through and you, you go through every single frequency you can fit in, and then you measure how much of that is in your original signal, and then and then you get your FFT out. Um, and then for OFDM, it was you know way back. It, it was it blew my mind that you could do that kind of in, inversion, and, and in, in fact, you know, builds on FFT, or, you know, essentially doing that transformation again. Um, and again, in, in terms of actually teasing that out and experimenting with it, it's just you know doing some some little simulations in NumPy or, or with um, with GNU Radio to sort of prove prove that that point in, in your head. If we're going to do a, a 30 second FFT explanation from Bonland, then I, I'd like a, a 37 second uh, explanation of I and Q from Mike Osman. <laughs> because I caught half of this as he was explaining it to a 12 year old kid who was following it way better than I am. So I figure if he could follow it, then yeah, okay, he's probably still smarter than me. But please, here, here's your uh, at least 37 second explanation of how I and Q works. This is going to be longer than 37 seconds, but I'll try to fit it into a reasonable, reasonable <laughs> length here. Uh, so for me personally, the biggest aha in dealing with SDR was just becoming comfortable with complex numbers. And when I say comfortable with complex numbers, I mean that I could sit down next to a complex number and I would say, oh, hi, you're a number. It's nice to see you. Uh, and I wouldn't say, whoa, you're something different than a number. Like, I'm totally comfortable with complex numbers. That is to say, numbers that have both a real and imaginary component, uh, that complex numbers are legitimate numbers in every way. And I find the word imaginary to be in ter terribly disrespectful to complex numbers. <laughs> you no longer have your God hates complex I, numbers. Exactly, <laughs> right. Like, like I, so I was just telling Skylar the other day, Skylar, are you in here? Uh, so anyway, he's this, you know, kid who runs around. I met him when he was like nine years old. Uh, and he's a DEF CON regular. And hopefully we will get him to give a talk next year because he totally should. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, he was asking me this question, and which is why Zero wants me to, because he, he overheard me talking to Skylar. Uh, uh, anyway, 
the the thing that uh, uh, so so I find it I find it kind of disrespectful of complex numbers that we call or imaginary numbers we call them imaginary. I don't think they're any more imaginary than negative numbers. I mean, if I walked up to you and said, "I have two apples and three oranges," and you'd be like, "Oh, okay, could I have an orange?" And I'd say, "Sure." Now I have two apples and two oranges. But if I walked up to you and I said, "I have two apples and negative five oranges," uh, that's a very abstract concept. It's imaginary to some extent, and I, it's I don't. In the financial system, all in the financial <laughs> system, they, they, right? It totally makes sense. But like, uh, okay, so I owe somebody three oranges or five oranges or whatever, and, or, and but that's an abstract concept. Having negative three oranges is an absurdity. And so, to me, imaginary numbers are no more imaginary or no more abstract than negative numbers are. Uh, it's a big leap conceptually to get from positive integers and like things you can count to negative numbers. And I don't think it's any more of a leap to describe uh, complex numbers. Uh, and, and I describe it to people in my class by, by just starting from square one and saying like, uh, what's, what's a number? And can we draw it on a number line? And what's addition and subtraction? And subtraction and addition are just shifting or translating along that number line. And what's multiplication and division? Well, they're, they're not shifting along the number line, they're scaling along the number line with respect to, to the origin, with, with respect to zero. But they're also not, they're not just scaling. Division and multiplication don't just scale a number on the number line, they also rotate it if you have a sign, if you have a negative number. So like, like if, if my elbow is the origin, like you can count one, two, three, four, and if you multiply four by negative one, you scale it by one, so you're still at four, but you rotate it a half turn over to negative four. I'll try not to slap Bowen in the face. Uh, but but uh, if you, and, and, so, and so this is a, bi a big recognition that just with these, with these simple operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and nothing else, we can describe translations along the number line, and we can also describe rotations around the number line, and we can also describe scaling along the number line. And can you translate, can you shift by an arbitrary amount? Sure. Can you scale by an arbitrary amount? Sure. Can you rotate by an arbitrary amount? Uh, maybe. Uh, you know, in our day-to-day -day experience dealing with positive and negative numbers, we deal with rotations of, you know, zero rotation to a half turn of rotation all the time. You, you rotate something, you multiply something by a negative number, you, it, it takes a half turn. If you rotate that by a negative number, it takes another half turn. But what if you could rotate by that much or that much? And if you just play the game of what if and say, what if there's a number that when I multiply by it, I rotate just a quarter turn, and then I multiply it again, and that rotates me another quarter turn. If you play that w game of what if and write that down as an algebraic expression, I think you'll find very, very quickly that you've just described imaginary numbers. And it takes almost it, it takes a very minimal knowledge of algebra to figure this out. It, you only have to deal with multiplication, division, subtraction, and addition to derive the fact that complex numbers exist and to create, uh, to realize that those basic arithmetic functions uh, apply to this whole plane of numbers and not just a number line. And uh, seriously, you don't have to do anything but basic arithmetic and very elementary algebra to figure it out. I agree with some of what you're saying, and I, I think what he's saying is you could do anything, you could do everything in real, but with real numbers, not not imaginary. But 
doing it in complex becomes uh, more convenient or becomes uh, uh, mathematically or in software more efficient. Uh, and I always go into that in my class. Like once I've introduced people to the concept of complex numbers, then I address, you know, why the hell is this the default data type in GNU Radio, right? Uh, like, what, uh, why, why is it computationally more efficient to conceptualize things as complex numbers? Uh, and you know, we don't have time to get into that in this discussion, but you know, spoiler, it is. Uh, <laughs> it, it's highly beneficial to conceptualize things as complex numbers, and you can come up with algorithms like the stuff in chapter 13 of Richard Lyon's book uh, that you would never dream of if you never thought of the things as being complex numbers. And I think actually uh, in GNU Radio, one of the, the most handy um, scope sinks to hopefully lead you to this epiphany is um, you know how you can drop in the signal scope. You can have the signal scope put in there and by default it will be in complex mode so you have your blue line and your green line for the, the real and imaginary components. But it also has the XY plot. And so when you hit that, you essentially get your complex plane up. So you have your real across the X and your imaginary on the Y. Uh, and then when you muck around with this a little bit, you can create a very simple experiment to get an idea of what negative frequency is. Because again, you talk about frequencies normally and then somebody says, oh, you, you know, with a complex um, baseband capture, you actually have twice the available bandwidth because you have I and Q. And so if you hook up a, a sine wave and you make the, uh, the frequency of the sine wave really, really low, like less than one hertz, you can make it positive or negative, but you can actually then see this dot circling around, mm -hmm. rotating around in the complex domain. And if you make it negative, then it'll start going in a negative direction. And that's what negative frequency is. So you can do these little, little uh, experiments um, and, and, you know, just, just simple things like that to, to get over that mental leap. Um, so one of the first steps for that kind of stuff is um, Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, repeat the question. oh, all right. So he was asking, uh, what is necessary to do something like Osmo BB? Are you guys familiar with Osmo BB? Sure. It's uh, the open source GSM baseband, but it's basically the Mac uh, part of GSM. So he was asking, like, kind of what's necessary to get something like Osmo BB running on um, SDRs and not just some like weird uh, TI Motorola phones. Um, so I think basically what is necessary for that is getting um, the Phi. That's basically all you need. Um, something that is able to do the GMSK modulation, the modulation, and the appropriate timing of um, the time slots for GSM. Because that's, that's basically what GSM needs. It needs the ability to send samples at a specific time, like um, I think, oh, I can't remember the exact spec from 3GPP, but it's pretty, it, it has some pretty stringent requirements. Uh, and then the other requirement is just to be able to do GMSK modulation and demodulation. And this can all be done in software as well. So basically you need to build the five that the Mac can set on top of. All right, we have another talk coming up in a few minutes, and so I'm going to do my very favorite part of this that I've been waiting the whole time for. Oh, We're going to have a fight to the death. <laughs> All right, go. No, uh, well, since it's going to be a very set because there can be only one. Ah, there, there can. No, actually, I think what, the world it? would be a, ba a bad place if we had these guys fight to the death. So instead, we're going to do a verbal fight to the death. Each one of you is here representing 
yourselves, however you do each uh, typically work with different hardware, some of you build the hardware yourselves, some of you work for companies that build the hardware yourselves, those of us that are interested in this on, on a past the RTL SDR point, give a short description of what your hardware is capable of and what projects you feel that it would be best suited for because in fact they're all really good products and for different things one of them often stands out although not always but for different things one of them often stands out as the better choice for X. So why don't you just give a, a short description of you know each one of the components and, and why people might want to use them and for what? Yeah, use cases. Use cases. <laughs> so this is what a fight to the death looks right. like. I'll start. I'll All start. Right. I, was just, I was just about to say my reason. Oh, go ahead. Uh, game theory says that the first person to mention a number or a quantitative response is the one to lose. So I'm All right. So that's me. <laughs> uh, so uh, the. Uh, first of all, the, the SDR hardware that I have in my lab. What's it called? What's it called? What? No, the, the things that I have in my lab are uh, HackRF, of course, because I make it, uh, LateRF, uh, USRP, and RTL SDR. Like, those are the things for me that are the most useful devices that are affordable enough to be in my lab. Uh, so, you know, I'm, it's really cool to be up here with these guys because, uh, uh, and, and it'd be great if we had somebody who, like, developed the RTB, RTL, uh, chip up here too, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh... You know, that, that's a really good point. This is probably <laughs> this one guy in, right. in, 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 I don't know, I mean, in China, I guess? Probably. D d developed a small piece of that silicon. Yep. And had absolutely no idea what the future would hold for it, that it would be used for a completely different purpose. And, you know, where is this guy? Because I know Anti Palisari, the guy that actually yeah. discovered this mode, right. you know, he's out there. If we find out who invented Bitcoin, we can certainly find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. There you go. If we could. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so uh, uh, those are, I think, the tools that are, I find to be the most compelling for applications that I can imagine. Uh, but, you know, reasons why you might like HackRF in particular. Uh, for one thing, it's open source hardware. Uh, it comes with a license for you to do, uh, uh, for you to reuse the, the hardware design how you want to. Uh, so that's something that kind of sets it apart. Uh, another thing that sets it apart is that it's an absurdly wide operating frequency range for the cost. Um, and for me personally, it, you know, I, the reason I started making HackRF or started the project in the first place was because I wanted something in my bag. I wanted something that I could carry around with me all the time and I could just pull it out of my bag and use it for any radio purpose. Uh, so it has the trade-offs, the design trade-offs that you would expect, right? I, I really focused on making it low cost and low power and small and portable. Uh, and so, so running off of USB 2.0 power and not violating that spec, uh, is a challenge. You know, really, that was probably the biggest design challenge was, was what trade-offs do I have to make? Like, for example, not including an FPGA. Uh, <laughs> you know, what trade-offs do I have to make to meet that spec and, and operate at that low power and have low cost? Uh, and, you know, uh, or like not being full duplex, right? That's that's a drawback of the HackRF design that I was, it was something I was willing to do in order to achieve my goals of low cost and low power. Um, and, and so for me, you know, the applications that HackRF is, the app, the one application that HackRF is best for is being the thing that you keep in your laptop bag all the time and can pull out for whatever application you need. Okay, I guess I'll go next then. Um, so, you know, originally I was doing my own thing, and then um, I came over here, and I'm, I'm Matt, 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 Edis, <laughs> and he offered me a job. And so, you know, obviously I'm going to be a bit biased, but I'll try and do the quick, painless sales pitch. Because actually, interestingly, I'm going to admit this publicly in the organisation now because Edis was bought by National Instruments. I'm 
in the marketing organization now. <laughs> <laughs> I was under R&D and, and, then, and then it made more sense for me to switch. But anyway, um, you know, the USEPs have been around for, for a little while. USEP 1 obviously kind of kick, kick-started the whole thing to, to borrow a, a popularized word combo now. Um, and I think, you know, we're a small team, but we're, we're pretty dedicated to, to sort of pushing the, the limits on what you can do with SDR in terms of, you know, bandwidth and size and portability and stuff like that. And, and I, to be honest, I don't, don't like the situation, but because these guys are doing really cool things too. Um, and, and, you know, having slightly different directions and different features and stuff. But I suppose, um, you know, we have a bunch of different lines. We've sort of got the B200, B210, which are sort of the enthusiast hobbyist market. Um, and that sort of pushes the limits now with USB 3. You know, you get um, 56 megahertz of bandwidth. Again, we're all dealing with, with ridiculous frequency ranges now. Um, and, and then, you know, as, as you've alluded to a lot, um, you know, multiple channels. So it's all about channel density, how many transmit and receive channels you can put on, on one particular card. So the B200 is sort of the integrated embodiment of that. And although it is a bit larger, um, you know, with my bias, I kind of throw it in my, my backpack as well. Um, and then, you know, if you really want to go crazy, we have other product lines as well. Like the one I keep talking about, is, it does 200 mega samples per second. You can put two daughter door boards in there, and it's you know, PCI Express and low latency and all that, that kind of stuff. And then um, in, in about a, a month, I hope, we're going to be releasing um, an embedded radio, which is about the size of a cell phone, and um, it has pretty much the same RF specs as the B200. Um, but it's fully integrated, um, dual core CPU, FPGA, and, and it'll be really exciting to see, you know, what, what comes out of that. Obviously, that's not going to be the sort of same price point, but in all these sorts of situations, you know, if you pay a little bit extra, you get some, you know, cooler features. But, um, you know, you've got a whole range to choose from, which is, which is really great, um, you know, to, to have in the system. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I guess we all kind of have like their own specialties and like our own strengths and stuff. Um, I think for Blade RF, like the biggest thing that we have is like the ability to do processing so close to the RF. And basically, a lot of my friends wound up being DSP and HDL people. So we basically have like a tight knit group of friends and community members that uh, we're all kind of like doing a whole bunch of like different uh, hardware modems and stuff at the moment. So. It's kind of like the platform is more kind of like a Swiss Army knife, and then you also kind of have like this like backing of a community of like crazy DSP and HTL engineers who are uh, working on a bunch of cool things in their spare time. So I'm also really hungry, so I can't really focus on what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd really like to point out that there's there's no winners and losers in in these descriptions. I mean, really. They're all really good pieces of hardware, and they all have very unique markets that push them out above the rest. And if you're doing something on one of them that it is really well driven for, you're going to be just thrilled to death. And if you, I don't know, try to run a GSM base station on a Hack RF, it's going to be really unpleasant, I think, for right now. Well, uh, just keep in mind, like Mike said, he has one of pretty much everything. And you've right. got to look at these things like it's a Swiss Army tool. Uh, you or a multi-tool or anything else along those lines. You pick the right tool for the right thing that you're trying to do. So ultimately, yeah, get them all and get more of all of them, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, but, absolutely. Get, get them all. I, I highly recommend doing that. None of these guys even sponsored us, but seriously, get, get them all. I mean, actually, I, th I think at least most of you gave us toys, so most of you did sponsor us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's the marketing team on that one? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we were running a wireless capture the flag, and, and everybody was was kind enough to help out, or to come talk, or to let me do this to them on stage and video it, and then put it online. So I, I really appreciate you guys coming here. You you all do amazing things every day. Sometimes with unique hardware, sometimes with exactly the same hardware, and it's it's great that all of you are willing to not only come and and appease me over here, but to to actually release all of this stuff. I mean, as, as Mike said, his his target was open source and goes in your backpack. I mean, you, the, the first one's really what strikes me the most is this stuff is open source almost exclusively. It's all kinds of open source software that runs it. There's all kinds of people talking to like-minded people, sharing their experiences, sharing what they're learning and working together as a community. And honestly, I think it's one of the better sections of the the hacker community in this SDR space right now. 
I think people are, are really, by and large, just desperately trying to help each other get cooler stuff out. And I'd also like to thank you two for your assistance with the CTF. <laughs> <laughs> Tip of the hat for that. <laughs> yes, we do have a couple of CTF contestants that have been helped by uh, multiple panelists at once, so thank you. <laughs> you have a question if you. Uh, First one, buy them a beer. <laughs> yeah, so, so buy these buy guys this drinks. Buy a sandwich. Yeah, buy him a sandwich, sandwich? and then a beer. Uh, <laughs> Pork chop sandwiches. We have to close this in just a few seconds, so what I would like is to actually have you guys answer the question, because that is, in my opinion, one of the most important questions in open source. Where do these people come to find you or people like you to help give back to this? Anybody wants it? Well, I think the number one thing is, uh, and this may not relate to you specifically in your interest in HDL, but uh, you know there are a lot of uh, GNU Radio fanboys up here. Uh, GNU Radio is a fantastic, very large, very complicated open source platform for developing uh, diverse SDR applications. And the GNU Radio project can always use more help. Uh, if, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, it's a vibrant community, very active mailing list. Uh, the wiki is getting better, but it could use more love. The documentation, the API could use more love. Uh, more code and debugging is always helpful. So, you know, just jump onto the GNU Radio mailing list and ask uh, how you can help, or even better, look through the open bugs, look through what people are talking about on the mailing list and say, hey, can I tackle such and such? Uh, you know, if you make a specific offer, I think people will will help you help them. Um, and uh, I know for, so for my projects in particular, uh, the best way to get a hold of me and other people who are working on my projects is probably IRC. Uh, on Freenode, there's a HackRF channel, there's a Daisho channel, there's an UberTube channel, and you know, just jump into whatever is your interest, but there's also a GNU Radio channel, and I mean, uh, I, I think channel. we're all on we're the all yeah. Freenode. Yeah. They're, they're all on IRC, so, yeah. so that's just showing you how cool how did, we all are. Yeah, how so, did that happen? Uh, yeah. How did all of us end up on Freenode? Well, because Freenode is awesome. awesome. Yeah. Freenode gives us free channels, uh, and, and uh, you know, so especially for the open source stuff that we do, uh, that's a good way to uh, interact with people who are wanting to take part, wanting to contribute. Uh, so, if, so look for our mailing list, look for our IRC channels. Uh, I think that goes for all of us, but uh, and, and and fork uh, GNU Radio off GitHub, and then you can just submit pull requests and have it have it reviewed by the, the team. But for HDL yeah. in particular, I mean that FPGA offloading is is you know really hot topic with the newer radios and the bigger FPGAs. There's a lot of room to do really cool stuff, and it has been done before. Uh, you know, offloading things, and and in the end, then all you send to the host and back is is just your demodulated packets, for example. Um, but I think that you know FPGAs are not easy, and I think um, I think we're all in the same boat of trying to you know make that more accessible to users. So, so just you know architecting that whole whole thing. Yeah. So I think the TLDR is is there's a, there's a spot for everybody who wants to contribute back to this, no matter what your skill level is. There's always somebody that needs to read the documentation and actually report that it's wrong. That helps a lot, surprisingly. Yeah. Reporting bugs just in general is one of the things that a lot of these projects desperately need because people will test something and then they'll say, "Oh, this crap doesn't work," and then they'll just walk away. I mean, it probably worked for somebody else. Maybe if you report the bug, it'll work for more people. You know, things like that are great. Now, mind you, bug reports that actually have fixes, brand new code, these things are great, but, but people of all skill levels can help out and give back to the community. But closing on that topic, I'd love for there to be a lot of noise complaints by you all thanking these people for their contributions to the community. So let's piss off the neighbors. I'll buy him a beer. <laughs> sandwich. And a sandwich. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.